Anthony Rongvo, visiting us uh, from Yale University. Anthony was born and trained in, in, uh, in Belgium and trained in Brussels and started out in a, in a immun laboratory of immunology lab, but uh, studying really uh, metabolism of, of pre-B cells and B cell development. And during that work, he described uh, the role of the NAD pathway in, in promoting early B cell and lymphocyte development. He went from there to uh, Rich Favelle's lab in the around 2006, and, and there he started working on two projects which uh, have really, most recently, really been coming to fruition. Uh, one was a project studying uh, innate immune recognition of, of, uh, of signals, and in particular, looked at the way, uh, why apoptosis is a non-inflammatory death, why, why, we, why cells can die by apoptosis without inducing much immunity. Um, and came across the very interesting uh, finding, uh, again, in Richfeld's lab, but with, you know, a knockout a month, and now I guess with CRISPR-Cas9, it's about a knockout or a knock-in a week, um, <clears throat> but came across the, the identification that, that uh, genes in, in the, uh, <clears throat> the caspase pathway were associated with preventing um, mitochondrial DNA that's released during cell death in the cytoplasm from being recognized uh, by the uh, sting pathway and resulting in inflammation. This was a really uh, impressive paper published uh, recently in Cell, which I'm sure many of you uh, have seen, and I, I suspect he'll give us some insight in, into that work. But part of what, what uh, he has been doing and what Richard's lab has been doing now for well more than a decade is trying to develop uh, humanized mice that can be used for studying innate immune recognition, and it's turned out that that's been a particular difficult problem in terms of the failure of the innate immune system to develop in most of the humanized mice. Um, and through a sequential series of knock-ins, which started with the uh, thrombopoietin and then now is advanced, and probably one of the most useful has been the knock-in of, uh, or the uh, transgene of human SERP alpha, which is preventing uh, uh, engulfment of some of the innate immune cells. Um, he's got a, he has a, now a mouse model with uh, essentially five genes, five human genes added now that really allows a study of the human innate immune system as well as the metaportic system, system in mice, and I'm quite sure he's going to give us a description of that. So it's a real pleasure, Anthony, to have you. Thank you very much for this introduction and for this opportunity to present my work here. So I'm going to present today two projects, uh, one using mouse models and the other one on humanized mice. But first I would like to start very briefly with a description of what innate immunity and the inflammatory response are. So inflammation or innate immunity can be induced in response of a number of stresses such as infection, injury, or different kinds of tissue stress or malfunction. And the response induced by that is the goal of restoring tissue homeostasis. And when everything works fine, uh, this is accomplished by producing an, uh, antimicrobial factors, inducing tissue repair, and triggering an adaptive immunity uh, mediated by T cells and B cells that's going to develop uh, also a memory response for future infections. However, this is also a dangerous response. If it's not properly controlled, it can result in pathology such as sepsis, autoimmunity, or fibrosis. So this shows that it's very important to understand the cellular and the molecular mechanisms that regulate this balance between the physiological and beneficial effects of the inflammatory response versus the pathological consequences. So immunologists like to use animal models uh, to, to address those questions, and in particular, the mouse is a very useful one because it's a small animal model in which we can do a lot of genetic manipulation and experimentation, but the limitation is that it's not a human, it's just a model, so there can be some differences. Humans, in contrast, are much more relevant for diseases and more representative of the human uh, genetic diversity, but we are much more limited uh, with what we can do experimentally on human uh, subject, of course. So what we would need, ideally, would be a model, model that combines the advantages. That would be a small animal model with 
the characteristic of the human species, and we believe that humanized mice can provide some of those advantages. So I'm going to start today with the first uh, project exclusively on mouse models uh, on the silencing of the immune response of apoptotic cells. So tissue homeostasis is maintained by the balance between the formation of new cells that differentiate and proliferate from stem cells and the death of an equivalent number of cells to maintain the, uh, the size of the tissue. So this is something actually important because some tissues have different uh, rates of turnover, but the total number of cells that have to die every day is quite impressive. So uh, the intestinal epithelium is probably the champion. There are trillions of cells that need to be replaced every five days approximately. So it means that trillions of cells just in the intestine have to die every five days. And if this is not done properly, then it can result into different kinds of problems. If cell death is defective, it can result in cancer of, or autoimmune or inflammatory diseases. If there is uh, increased cell death, depending on the tissue, it can result in diseases such as neurodegenerative diseases or immunodeficiency. Now, there are many ways by which a cell can die. And I listed here a few of the types of cell death that we can find in the literature. Each of them is characterized by different stimuli that induce them and different biochemical characteristics. One of the most uh, best described is apoptosis, which is a highly regulated process. It's highly conserved during evolution from worms to mammals. So one of the important questions that we would like to address is why is apoptosis so conserved during evolution when we have all those other mechanisms of cell death that could just uh, kill the cells in the same way? Uh, so what's special about apoptosis? One of uh, the hypotheses that emerged in the past few years is that apoptosis is unique in its capacity to kill uh, cells in, an, uh, in a manner that does not elicit an immune response. So in most types of cell death, including necrosis, when plasma membrane is disrupted, it releases a lot of intracellular molecules that have some immunostimulatory or pro-inflammatory properties. So those molecules are collectively called DAMs or alarmins. In contrast, in apoptotic cell death, uh, there is formation of those apoptotic bodies. The integrity of the plasma membrane is maintained, and those apoptotic bodies can be cleared uh, by macrophages without releasing anything, anything. So that's one of the hypotheses why uh, apoptosis would be immunologically silent. But the detailed mechanisms by which this occurs, and, and in particular, what is the role of caspases in this process, are still uh, mostly unknown. So that's the question we wanted to address. So first, let's have a look at how apoptosis is induced. There are two main pathways, and I have to say that this is a highly simplified uh, representation of cell death. One pathway is the extrinsic pathway induced by engagement of the so-called death receptors by uh, FAS ligand or TNF, signaled through caspase 8, and then the downstream effector caspase 3 and 7. I'm not going to talk about this pathway today. I'm going to focus exclusively on the intrinsic or mitochondrial pathway of apoptosis. It's controlled by the balance between the expression and the function of BCL2 family members. So there are pro and anti family, uh, pro and anti apoptotic family members in the, in, of BCL2. And depending on the balance between those, they regulate formation of a pore in the mitochondrial outer membrane by the back and back channel. When this pore is, for, is formed, cytochrome is released in the cytoplasm where it contributes to the formation of this big complex called the apoptosome, in which cyclochrome C interacts with APAF1 and caspase 9. And caspase 9 uh, in this complex is activated, acquires its enzymatic protease activity, and activates the effector caspases, caspase 3 and 7. So caspase 3 and 7 are effector proteases, and they cleave many, many substrates in the cells to just destroy the cell. Now, one of the complications to study this pathway that uh, genetic defi deficiency in any of those genes results in embryonic lethality. So the first thing we had to do was to generate mice with a condition conditional deletion in caspase 9, which was caspase 9 because it has a central role here in this pathway. And we crossed it to 
try to CRE, which efficiently deletes the gene in hematopoietic. This is not a very specific deleter, but at least we have mice that live to adulthood with a knockout immune system. And we also generated caspase 3 conditional knockout with the same CRE specific deletion and crossed it to caspase 7 knockout to get the single and the double conditional knockout mice. So we first looked at those mice, and surprisingly, their immune system looked quite normal. All the cell types are there in relatively normal frequencies. But when we tried to stimulate this immune system, we found a lot of deficiencies. And one of the most striking phenotypes that we found is that caspase deficiency res results in resistance to viral infection. So this is shown here in an experiment where we infected the mice with the encephalomyocarditis virus, or EMCV. You can see that it's a very lethal virus. All the control mice die within six days after infection, while in the mice that lack caspase 9 in their immune system, they survive longer, and some of them even survive long term. This correlates with a much lower uh, viral load in the heart, measured here by PCR 48 hours after infection. We observed a similar phenotype when we infected the same mice uh, with VSV, so the vesicular stomatitis virus, that's here an intranasal infection, and we measure viral load in the blood 24 hours later. You can see that mice that lack caspase 9 are completely resistant. We cannot detect any virus in the blood of those mice. And the same is true for the caspase 3 and 7 double deficient mice. Next, we tried to recapitulate this observation in vitro. For that, we derived mouse embryonic fibroblasts from caspase 9 white type and knockout mice, and we infected them with a strain of VSV that also expresses GFP, which makes it easier to detect. You can see here that white type cells are infected, shown by GFP expression here by fluorescence, uh, by microscopy, and by fax, while the caspase 9 deficient cells are much more resistant. This is quantified here. We use the range of doses of the virus, and we need to use a really high dose of the virus to detect some GFP expression. And also, when we measure viral uh, progeny in the supernatant, you can see that depending on the dose, there is a two to four log decrease uh, in viral production. So that's a pretty strong phenotype. Next, we looked at other uh, molecules in the pathway, so APAF1, which is a partner of caspase 9 in the apoptosome, and we found the same phenotype when we infected those uh, fibroblasts. They are resistant to VSV infection, shown here by GFP expression and by viral progeny production. And also the same for caspase 3, 7 double knockout. Single knockouts don't have any effect, but when we knock out both of them, they have a redundant uh, role. Uh, we observe a resistant phenotype very comparable to what we saw in caspase 9 knockouts. So now it's well known that cell death and apoptosis is a mechanism of defense against viral infection. A cell that's infected by a virus dies, commits suicide, so it cannot uh, spread the virus. Uh, but if this was the mechanism involved, we would expect the opposite phenotype. An infected cell cannot die and continues to produce virus. We would expect more viral production. So obviously there's something else going on. So we decided to look for other described antiviral responses. And an important response to viral infection is the type 1 interferon response. So this slide summarizes how the type 1 interferon response works. It's initiated by the recognition of, uh, of the virus, generally viral nucleic acids, by different types of receptors. It signals through RF, RF3 and 7 molecules to generate, to induce the secretion of interferon beta, which is released uh, which is secreted and binds the type 1 interferon receptor. Then uh, there is signaling through uh, STAT1 and, different, and other factors that leads to the expression of a number, hundreds actually, uh, genes or ISGs. And those ISGs contribute to two things. First, they amplify the signaling pathway, which results in the secretion of a second wave of type 1 interferon and amplification of the response. And also, those hundreds of gene, genes or proteins uh, inter, uh, interfere with many cellular functions, and together they contribute to establish a state of viral resistance. So we wanted to look in our caspase deficient cells and animals if there was a defect uh, or something abnormal with this response. So first, we looked for type interferons themselves. So in steady state conditions, uh, it's really difficult to 
uh, detect them by uh, regular PCR, but it's described that they are expressed and they are functional at steady state. So we use the more sensitive assay, we use the nested PCR simulation, and you can see here that while it's completely undetectable here, we can detect them now, and there is a difference between the knockout and the white type. It's higher in the knockout. But this is a really mild increase compared to that. We quantified it here, it's approximately a five to eight fold induction, while this would be a 1,000 to sometimes 10,000 fold induction. So that's really weak. We confirmed it with uh, a bioassay, which measures type one interferon activity, and again, it's really weak, so this uh, shows the, uh, the limit of detection of the assay. White types are just below detection. Knockouts are just a little bit higher than the detection limit. But this is highly reproducible, although really weak. Next, we looked for the expression of ISG, so those interferon stimulated genes. And here it was much easier to detect a difference. So I'm showing here two examples of ISGs, ISG15 and RF7. In fibroblasts, again, you can see that without any stimulation at all, Caspase knockout cells express high levels of those two ISGs. It's uh, between 10 and 100 fold increase, and it's actually close to the maximum level that we can reach when we stimulate the cells with type point front NEP cells. And we found a similar in in induction uh, in vivo. This is expre uh, expression of ISG15 on white blood cells from the caspase deficient animals that I described a few slides ago. So we find increase of steady state type of interference, constitutive expression of ISGs in caspase 9 deficient cells, but also in caspase 3 and 7 double knockout and in EPAF1 knockout. We also tried to recapitulate this observation using simply a caspase inhibitor. So there are many of those available. We treated cells with this inhibitor, QVDOPH, that's one of the most recent and most effective ones. And you can see that 48 hours later, when we did uh, RNA-seq of those cells, there was expression of a number of genes here. I listed 10 or 12 of them. If you are a little bit familiar with the interferon response, you will recognize them as uh, typical ISGs. And this shows a more complete analysis. So you can see that the treatment with the caspase inhibitor induces expression of hundreds of gene, genes. But when we treat cells that lack the type interferon receptor, there is no response at all showing that they are actually interferon induced. So now we still need to demonstrate that caspase inhibition is responsible for the resistance to viral infection. And we did that with a very simple experiment. We harvested the supernatants from caspase 9 white type or knockout cells. We transferred those supernatants on white type cells in the presence or absence of blocking antibodies from type 1 interferons. We incubated for 24 hours, then we washed and we infected. And what happened there is that the white type cells that were incubated overnight with caspase 9 supernatants were resistant to viral infection, showing that the, the antiviral activity is contained in the supernatant. And it was completely uh, inhibited by the anti-interferon uh, antibodies. So this demonstrates that the viral resistance is mediated by type 1 interferons. So the, to summarize those first observations, the well-described type 1 interferon pathway that leads to viral resistance is under negative control by the EPAF1 caspase 9 and caspase 37 pathway known to be necessary for apoptosis induction. So that was a very surprising uh, observation, and it raised a number of questions. The first one is, is this related to the proapoptotic function of this pathway, or is it a non-apoptotic role? The second one, if type point interferon is induced, what is the ligand that's going to engage uh, a receptor and lead to the expression of those interferons? And third, if there is a ligand, how is it contained in white type cells? Let's first this question, the apoptotic or non-apoptotic uh, role. So for that, we went upstream in the pathway, and we looked at the, the antiviral response in cells that are deficient for BACs and BAC. So in terms of apoptosis, uh, BACs-BAC deficiency completely phenocopies APAF1, caspase 9 or caspase 37 deficiency. However, when we infected those, my, those cells, the BACs-BAC deficient with VSV, you can see that the phenotype was very different from what we saw in caspase deficiency. The cells were 
perfectly infected by, GFP, by VSV GFP and actually produce more virus, which is actually what we would expect from an infected cell that cannot die. So this would suggest that those molecules act on the interferon response independently of the mitochondrial events of uh, apoptosis. It's actually more complex than that, and this is a key experiment to understand the mechanism. So as before, we used back back white up cells, uh, treated them with a caspase inhibitor, and this resulted in expression without any other stimulation to, of ISG. So I'm showing here ISG15 and RF7. But when we did the same experiment on back back deficient cells, they were not able to respond to the caspase inhibition. So how do we interpret this? So this is the situation in the knockout cells. There is no back and back treated with inhibitor. There are no caspases. The interferon response is low. There is no viral resistance or no expression of ISGs at least. When we remove the, uh, when we do the same experiment in uh, back back white type, now the channel is there. Cytochrome C can be released, and also the, uh, the interferon response goes up. So this suggests that when we open the back back channel, we also release something that can induce the expression of type 1 interferons. And finally, when we have a white type cell, uh, white type cell without the caspase inhibitor, so now cytochrome C can activate this, the pathway is under negative control uh, by caspase. So this suggests that there is a ligand release from mitochondria through the back and back channel. So now you're probably thinking that there's something wrong with this model because we don't treat the cells with any propoptotic signal, so the back back channel should be closed and there shouldn't be anything happening. We believe that this is happening in the three or four percent cells that always die in a cell culture, or those billion cells that die every day in the human body. And to, if this model is correct, then if we were able to actually open the back back channel, we should amplify the response and trigger stimulation of type 1 interferons. So that's what we did in the next experiment. So BCL2 is an endogenous inhibitor of back and back. And this drug, ABT737, is an inhibitor of BCL2. So when we treat cells with this BCL2 inhibitor, we can actually open the back and back channel. And when we treated cells uh, with this inhibitor, you can see here, it doesn't do anything to the expression of type 1 interferons. The caspase inhibitor alone doesn't do anything either at those early time points. But when we combined both this inhibitor that opens the back back channel with the caspase inhibitor, now we get a really strong induction of type 1 interferons, which is actually comparable to the, type, the kind of response that we would see during a viral infection. So that's what I call the back back dependent caspase regulated type 1 interferons. So I'll try to keep things as simple as possible in the next slides. So we will have two uh, protocols to uh, uh, to induce type 1 interferons. The first one is this back back caspase regulated type 1 interferons. We treat with this inhibitor to open the channel and the caspase inhibitor to, uh, to prevent the negative regulation by caspases. And we use a positive control, which is transfection of genomic DNA, which is known to induce type 1 interferons. So now the next question is to determine what this potential ligand could be. What's the signal that comes out of mitochondria and induce type 1 interferons. <coughs> so the mechanisms by which type 1 interferons are induced in a cell are quite well described, and there are essentially two uh, pathways uh, used. The first one is cytosolic RNA recognition through the rig eye and MAF pathway, or the cytosolic DNA, uh, which involves SIGA sting, and both of them converge to TBK1, IF37, and type 1 interferons. So first, we looked at the involvement of TBK1 and RRF. So here we use white up cells. We treat them with our double induced, the back back dependent caspase regulated type of interferons. And we compare them to our positive control transfected genomic DNA. You can see that the double inhibitor induces phosphorylation of TBK1 and RF3, which is comparable to our positive control. So it shows that TBK1 and RF37 are involved. This is confirmed by this genetic experiment where we treat cells that lack IF3 and 7, they do not respond anymore uh, to the double inhibitor. 
So this shows that these signaling molecules are involved. Next, we tested whether the site of the zika RNA pathway was involved. For that, we used MAVS deficient cells. And when we treated with the double inhibitor, the absence of MAVS didn't do anything. So it means that it excludes the role of cytosolic RNA recognition. Then we had the cytosolic DNA recognition pathway, which is mediated by this very interesting molecule uh, described a couple of years ago, approximately. So when it recognizes cytosolic DNA, it acquires an enzymatic activity, which results in the formation of this dinucle cyclic dinucleotide, CGAMP, that binds Sting and activates it. So the first thing we did is to measure the presence of CGAMP in the cells. So you can see here that untreated cells, in untreated cells, CGAMP is completely undetectable. And after treatment with our double inhibitors, we have a nice peak of CGAMP that uh, co-migrates perfectly with our standard in this experiment. So this suggests that this pathway is involved. And this is confirmed with its genetic experiment. We knock out CGAS or we knock out Sting, and we completely lose the response uh, to the double inhibitor. So this means that the cytosolic DNA recognition pathway is involved. So now, we know that it's a mitochondrial ligand, and that it binds the uh, DNA recognition pathway. So the, our main candidate is, of course, mitochondrial DNA. So we wanted to test that. And for that, we used a protocol described by molecular biologists 40 or 50 years ago, which consists in treating cells in culture with a low dose of ethidium bromide. So what ethidium, ethidium bromide does, it intercalates in DNA, and this prevents the replication of circular DNA. So mitochondrial DNA, which is circular, cannot replicate anymore, but it does not affect uh, genomic DNA. So the cells are still alive and relatively healthy if we supplement media with everything they would need, uh, but they have an approximately tenfold reduction in their mitochondrial DNA content. Now, if we treat ethidium, ethidium bromide treated cells with our double inhibitor or positive control, you can see that after depletion of mitochondrial DNA, we completely lose the response, the phosphorylation of TBK1 and IF3, while the cells are still able to respond to transfected DNA. And when we measure type of interference themselves, you can see that there's a 20-fold reduction, approximately, uh, in the response to the double inhibitor, so the bax back dependent type of interference, while the response to HTDNA, so transfected DNA, is not affected by uh, mitochondrial DNA depletion, showing that the cells can still respond to uh, DNA sensing and produce type of interference. So this is our current model. So when cells undergo mitochondrial membrane permeabilization through backs and back, they release mitochondrial DNA that has the capacity to activate the CGAS, Sting, and antiviral response mediated by type of interference. In parallel to mitochondrial DNA release, cytochrome C is also released and activate caspases, which have a negative effect on this entire pathway. So there are three conclusions from this model. So as I explained in the beginning, um, cell death can be pro-inflammatory by releasing in the extracellular uh, space molecules that are supposed to be intracellular. In this case, it's slightly different. It's an intracellular ligand which is released in the cytosol and activates a cell intrinsic immune response. The second uh, conclusion is that backs back is the key point of decision to undergo apoptosis, which is supposed to be a non-inflammatory type of cell death. But what we show here is that backs back is actually a pro-inflammatory event. And it's only because, third conclusion, there is an anti-inflammatory activity of caspases that pro apoptotic uh, that apoptosis mediated by backs and back can be maintained uh, immunologically silent. Now, there are two important questions that, and on which we are currently working. The most obvious one is, how do caspases prevent this pathway? So if we look in the literature, we can find cleavage by caspases of 
any molecule we want because that's what caspases do. They destroy the cell. So we need to figure out which ones are relevant in this particular model. Uh, there are some data that show that RS are cleaved, TBK1 is cleaved, but we don't really know which ones are important. Another possibility is that uh, caspases induce the activation of caspase-dependent DNAs. That's well described. It contributes to this typical laddering of uh, genomic DNA in apoptotic cells. Those same caspase-dependent uh, DNAs could actually cleave mitochondrial DNA in the cytosol and prevent activation of the pathway. So this is something that we are working on now. Second and important question and really interesting question is, what's the physiological relevance of this? So we observe this phenomenon when we use caspase inhibitors or caspase deficiency, but when does it happen physiologically? So we can think about it in the context of the GUARD theory of pathogen recognition. So this theory consists in sensing a pathogen-specific activity rather than sensing the pathogen itself. So in this case, uh, it is known that several viruses encode caspase inhibitors, and that prevents cells from dying and the virus can continue to replicate. But now in this arms race between the host and the virus, the, the, the host would be able to sense that someone is trying to interfere with the, the apoptotic pathway, and it should alert the immune system. Another possibility is that it's more broad than what we just described, CGAS could actually be a sensor of mitochondrial permeabilization. There could be other mechanisms independent, independently of back and back during which mitochondria are stressed, really release their, cytosolic, uh, their mitochondrial DNA, and this could be a way to alert an immune response because if mitochondria are damaged, it means that something is going wrong, possibly an infection. So those are questions uh, for the future. So now I would like to move to the second part of my presentation, and I'm going to discuss our efforts to generate a new generation of humanized mice uh, that can be used to study human innate immune responses in vivo. And all this work on humanized mice is done in close collaboration with Marcus Mans in Switzerland. So what we call humanized mice is a mouse with a human immune system. And this slide describes the protocol we use to uh, generate those humanized mice. So we need a source of human hematopoietic stem cell or human hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, which, is con which are contained in the CD34 positive population that we isolate either from cold blood. Most of the experiments I'm going to show are from fetal liver, also from adult uh, donors. We transplant those cells into immunocompromised mice. So we first irradiate those mice to uh, eliminate their own immune system or hematopoietic system. And we inject the cells on the day of birth or a few days after birth in the liver, which is still a site of hematopoiesis for the first few days of life of the mouse. And then we wait for two to three months and the human immune system develops uh, in the mouse and hopefully we would have a fully functional and developed human immune system. Unfortunately, this human immune system has many defects, and one of the main defects is here in the myeloid lineage. So there are essentially no functional macrophages or monocytes that develop in the previous generation of humanized mice. This is illustrated here from a review that we wrote a couple of years ago. So in red, uh, the red color shows myeloid cells. You can see that it's actually the majority of the white blood cells in the human species. So this shows the different model developed uh, since the late 80s until early 2000s. So the most commonly used model is this one, is the NSG model. And you can see there are pretty much no myeloid cells in human myeloid cells in the blood of those mice. So we wanted to understand why there is this defect in human myeloid cell development, and we wanted to try to improve that. So myeloid development is a very complex and highly reg regulated process which starts with hematopoietic stem cells that differentiate into myeloid progenitors, more committed progenitors, and finally, uh, the terminally differentiated cells. And there are many cytokines that regulate uh, this process. And here, the color code shows the, the percentage of amino acid identity between mouse and human. And I'm showing here only the cytokines that are secreted by the stromal cells. So when we put human cells in the mouse, those mouse origin and the receptor would be human. So we don't really worry about the green ones, uh, which are more than 80% amino acid identity. 
assuming that they are most probably sufficiently cross-reactive. That's an arbitrary cutoff, obviously. The red one, less than 60%, I think, uh, are very unlikely to be cross-reactive. And the green one, in between, we don't really know. They are probably somewhat cross-reactive, but not fully. So with all those factors that are probably not cross-reactive uh, and are involved in minority differentiation, it seems obvious that those human cells would not develop properly in the mouse. So to try to improve that, we decided to humanize some of those genes. So the method we use is this VelociGen technology in collaboration with Regen. It consists in replacing the entire gene from the ATG to the stop codon to get this humanized allele. So now we have a double humanization of the mouse, a genetic humanization for the genes encoding some of the candidate cytokines, and then humanization by transplantation of human cells. So we did that for a number of cytokines, and we reported them a few years ago, so I'm not going to describe them in detail, but essentially we did thrombopoietin that improved HSC maintenance, IL-3 and GMCSF, so we worked mostly on the characterization of GMCSF that has an effect on the development of lung alveolar macrophages, and MCSF that improved monocyte differentiation. While those were significant effects, it was not extremely impressive. Uh, actually, a little bit disappointing, and the reason is quite easy to understand. If we improve HSCs, HSC maintenance, maybe we get more myeloid progenitors, but then they don't have the cytokines needed to bring them to the fully differentiated cells. And if we have the, the cytokines that are going to support their differentiation, if we don't provide the pathway with the progenitors, it's not going to work either. So what we decided to do is to cross all those mice together and generate one super mouse that we call Mr. G based on uh, the initials of all those cytokines. So now that's a quite complex uh, genotype, so I'm going to spend a minute to explain. So RAC2 and IL2 are gamma deficiency, results in the absence of mouse T, B, and NK cells. So the human cells do not get rejected by the immune system, by the mouse immune system when we transplant them. SERP alpha, that's a human transgene, a back transgene actually, induces phagocytic tolerance. So this is illustrated here. The ligand from SERP alpha is CD47, and it's not cross-reactive between human and mouse. Uh, and it's, it's a negative signal that prevents phagocytosis by macrophages. So now when we humanize SERP alpha on the mouse macrophages, now CD47 can engage the, the receptor, provide what is called the don't eat me signal, and prevent phagocytosis of the human cells when we transplant them. And finally, all the cytokines that I described that support maintenance of HSCs and myeloid development. So in the next slide, I'm going to show comparison between four groups of mice. So RG, R gamma, uh, RAG gamma double knockout. It's the original model we started with several years ago, described more than 10 years ago now by Marcus Matt, our collaborator. NSG, it's functionally equivalent to SERP RAG gamma. We decided to use that one as a control because it's the most commonly used in the field, so it's a good comparison. And then Mr. G's and their litter mate controls that lack the SERP alpha uh, transgene. Those two are pretty much similar. There are some differences, but they are not really important for the presentation today, so we can just consider that they are the same. So we engrafted those mice using the protocol that I described with transplantation of human HSCs in the liver on the day of birth. And we analyze the uh, engraftment levels in the bone marrow three months later, approximately. So you can see that the RAG gamma double knockout was good 10 years ago, but it's much better. NSG completely replaced that model for an obvious reason. It's, uh, it supports uh, better engraftment. Mr. G and Mr. G, you can see here, are even better than NSG. So obviously this is not very quantitative because we saturate the system, but um, this suggests that Mr. G supports even more human hematopoiesis than NSGs, and this will be important later when instead of using those fetal liver-derived HSCs, which are very potent and engrafting because they are fetal, so they are really young, they still have potential to differentiate. When we use adult cells, they are much more difficult to engraft, and you will see that it makes a big difference uh, in that case. So that's the bone marrow. In a periphery, again, RAGAMA was not really good, and between NSG and Mr. G, I would say that 
in terms of overall investment levels, they are pretty much similar. But now when we look at the composition of those human cells in the blood of NSG versus MistoG, you can see that it's quite different. So both uh, mice have development of human B cells, T cells, but there are very few uh, myeloid cells in NSGs where we have a very distinct population of myeloid cells uh, here in MistoG's. So this is quantified here. You can see that in NSGs it's generally less than 10% in most of the mice, while in MistoG's it's between 30 and 50% in most of the animals. And overall, this results in a blood composition that looks much more like what we would find uh, in humans, which is rich in myeloid cells. So we started from 10% approximately, and now we have 40 to 50% on average myeloid cells in the blood of those animals. So I'm not going to show the data on NK cells, but you can see that there's also an increase in the frequency of NK cells, and we also did a lot of experiments to show that they are more functional. And that's an interesting effect. Actually, human myeloid cells are producing IL-15, which is one of the key factors required for the development and function of NK cells. So we have an indirect effect of the human myeloid cells on NK cells. So this is in the blood. We also find those human myeloid cells in different tissues, such as lung, liver, and colon, while they were very difficult to detect in NSG. So this is a staining for CD68. And another thing that we were interested in looking for is the diversity of the subsets of myeloid cells that uh, develop in those mice. So in humans, three main subsets of monocytes have been described based on the expression of CD14 and CD16. So there is those 14 positive, 16 negative, the double positives, and the 16 positive CD14 low. So what you can see is that in addition to the much higher uh, frequency of those myeloid cells, um, in Mr. G's than in NSG, the diversity of the subset that are present is also improved. So in NSG, there is mostly this subset that should not exist. I'm not sure what it is. While here in Mr. G, we have those three characteristic subsets. So now the relative frequency of those three is not really reflecting the human distribution. So we don't know yet why uh, this is. So this is quantified here. Very few of those um, CD14 low 16 positive cells that are actually extremely interesting to, to study. Uh, so the distribution is not really the same, but we did a lot of experiments in vitro to characterize them based on the expression of a number of markers and also their functional properties when we isolate them, including phagocytosis and cytokine production. Uh, all three subsets isolated from Mr. G behave very similarly to the same, the equivalent subsets isolated from human blood, so we are confident that those cells represent uh, real human monocytes. So we did a few in vivo stimulations. The first one, very simple experiment with induced endotoxic shock uh, with LPS. There's a really low response in NSGs, a much stronger response in MitoG, or MistoG, yes, both. It's more than 10 to 100 fold in increase, sorry. We also did a viral infection and measure type of interferons in the lung. So you can see that, again, in NSG, there is a response, but it's really weak, while in Mr. G mice, we have a really strong type of interferon response. So uh, those results show that Mr. G is superior to NSG in terms of supporting human uh, hematopoiesis and differentiation and function of innate cells mostly uh, monocyte macrophages and also NK cells. So now I would like to show you uh, results in which we try to model human diseases using this model. And the first model is uh, solid tumors with a focus on the role of monocytes and macrophages. So what is known is that macrophages infiltrate human tumors and from clinical observations, uh, it's known that macrophages actually support tumor growth. So this comes from observation of strong correlation between high density of macrophage infiltration in the tumor and poor patient prognosis. So that's a bit counterintuitive that our immune system would support tumor growth. But actually what's happening is that uh, macrophages are capable of uh, doing tissue repair. But in the context of, um, of the tumor, tissue repair becomes or tumor support. 
So this is an example shown here of the CD163 positive human macrophages that infiltrate a human melanoma. And we collaborated with Karina Paluka to try to develop a model and see if we could recapitulate this role of macrophages. So we did first engraftment of a human immune system, SB4, and then we transplanted a human melanoma cell, cell line in NSGs and in Mr. G's. And the questions we wanted to ask were, do human myeloid cells infiltrate the tumor? Do they affect tumor growth? And if they do, by which mechanisms? So this uh, slide shows infiltration of human macrophages, CD163, it's in green now, uh, in patients, so there is high infiltration. In NSG, we cannot detect any macrophage infiltrating the tumor. When in Mr. G, there is a high density of uh, macrophages, of human macrophages in the tumor. And this is quantified here. It's very easy to find them when they are completely invisible in NSGs. We also did a little bit of characterization of their phenotype. Particularly, we looked for this M2-like phenotype, which is, which is generally associated with this tissue repair or tumor supporting uh, function. And we, I'm showing here one marker, CD206. You can see that in both the patient, the tumor from the patient, and in the tumor from Mr. G, all, most of the myeloid cells, the macrophages, also express this M2-specific marker. Now, the cells infiltrate the tumor and have an M2-like phenotype. Does it matter? Does it do anything to tumor growth? So this shows tumor growth in NSGs and Mr. Gs that were not engrafted with the human immune system. The, the tumors look small and quite similar. But now when we have mice that were previously engrafted with human CD34 cells, so they have a human immune system, doesn't make any difference for NSGs, but you can see that the Mr. G tumors or the tumors in Mr. G are bigger and they look very different. They are probably more vascularized and are probably also hemorrhagic, which is something which is described for uh, tumors. So this is uh, quantified here. So no human immune system, no difference between NSG and Mr. G. With a human immune system, no effect in NSGs, but the tumors grow more in Mr. G. So those are the tumors infiltrated with the human macrophages. So as we saw this, effect that suggested that there was an, uh, a role for vascularization. We next treated the mice with uh, an inhibitor of vascularization. We used the VGF inhibitor Avastin, and you can see that we completely reversed the tumor support phenotype. Uh, so this, this suggests that the macrophages support tumor growth in a VGF-dependent manner. Now, one of the weaknesses of this model is that we used fetal liver-derived hematobic cells and the tumor cell line, so they are completely mismatched in terms of HLA. So what we are doing now, still in collaboration with Carolina and more recently with Robert Schreiber, is trying to reconstruct patient-derived humanized mice. So we get CD34, so the hematopoietic progenitor from the patient, the tumor from the same patient, and we also use the peripheral blood cells that contain effector T cells generated in the, in the patient, and we are trying to reconstruct those mice. So this is a work in progress. I don't have any data to show you uh, yet, but we are hoping to be able to study the anti-tumoral immune response in those humanized mice, and eventually uh, use them to test and maybe also develop immunotherapies. So I'm going now to finish with another disease model, and that's in collaboration with Stephanie Halin. She's a hematologist at the Yale Cancer Center. So she's really interested in myelodysplastic syndromes. Um, and in a random discussion, she once told me that Mr. G would be a great model to study MDS. So we decided to try. So what are myelodysplastic syndromes? So it's a disease of hematopoietic stem cells, which is characterized by the abnormal maturation of one or more myeloid cell lineages. It's a highly heterogeneous disease, and one of the criteria to uh, distinguish those diseases is to count the percentage of blasts in the bone marrow sample. So I don't really know much about all those diseases. That's Stephanie's field of expertise. But what we know is that it's a disease extremely difficult to study because there is no good animal models, and those uh, samples from patients with MDS cannot be engrafted into uh, the currently available models of humanized mice. So that's shown here. Normal HSCs are quite easy to engraft. All those uh, MDS samples are 
essentially impossible to engraft, and only some of the most aggressive VMLs can be easily engrafted uh, in mice. So we tried uh, to engraft some samples. Stephanie sees a lot of patients. She always keeps some bone marrow frozen in her liquid nitrogen. So she went back to her collection, and we put them into humanized mice. So this is first showing normal CD34. So that's from the bone marrow of a patient that didn't have any disease. So you can see that it's much more difficult to engraft those adult hematoid stem cells than the fetal liver ones. So in this case, it doesn't work very much in NSGs. It works much better in Mr. G. So you remember when I said that it would be important to have uh, Mr. G for more difficult samples, this is shown here. Now, RCMD, so this, this is one of those diseases with low blast. are still extremely difficult to engraft, but in some of the mice, we get decent levels of engraftment in the bone marrow of Mr. G's or NSG. RAB1 is a little bit easier to engraft. If we use a cutoff of 1% of engraftment, most of the animals reach that cutoff, so it works quite well by those criteria. And finally, RAB2 is much easier to engraft, and you, uh, we can even do secondary transplantation of those samples, so re-isolate those human cells from the mouth, transplant them in a second mouth, it still works better than in NSG first. Transplantation. So you can see here that all those diseases in NSG doesn't work really well, while MDS we start a little bit higher, and those diseases become more easy to engraft. Now it's important also to demonstrate that what we engraft is actually a disease and not some normal HSC that are still in the sample. So for that, uh, we use the same cytogenetic characterization as was done for the patient. So this example, uh, the patient was diagnosed with trisomy 15, and we found the same trisomy 15 in the cells isolated from the humanized mouse. And in this case, it's a 5Q deletion that was found in 10% of the cells of the patient. So this is a normal cell. There are two copies of 5P and 5Q, while here in some of the cells, most of the cells actually in Mr. G, there is one copy of 5Q is missing. And finally, hematologists are uh, very happy when they see that. To me, it doesn't mean uh, much, but when they compare, when they see a bone marrow like this one, they can describe it as MDS based on the presence of megakaryocytes and uh, fibrosis stained by reticulin. You can see that what is found in the bone marrow sample of the patient is very similar to what we found uh, in the mouth. So we are uh, relatively confident that we actually engrafted the disease and that the disease recap uh, that the, the engrafted sample recapitulates some of the characteristics of the disease. So to conclude that second part, Mr. G mice are highly promising for human hematopoiesis. They support the development and function of, of diverse subsets of human monocytes. Those myeloid cells can infiltrate the tumor and support its growth. And finally, combining uh, the two characteristics, so efficient hematopoiesis and myeloid differentiation, uh, Mr. G support the engraftment of myelodysplastic hematopoiesis and provide a new model for this disease. So to conclude, I hope that I convinced you that mouth is extremely helpful uh, to identify some funda fundamental mechanisms of the immune response. That humanized mice hopefully will be useful to translate those findings to the human species, but also that humanized mice are useful to develop animal models of human diseases and eventually uh, could be useful to develop new vaccines or new immunotherapies. So with that, I would like to thank everybody who contributed to this work. So Richard Favell, of course, who is a wonderful mentor and extremely supportive. Um, People who contributed, contributed to the work on caspesis, particularly Rory Jackson, who helped me with a lot of the Western blots. He likes that, apparently, Western blots. Um, John Alderman, our lab manager, and the three technicians who used to do DSL work. We got a lot of help from different labs, including Akiko Iwasaki, Jerry Shadell, and James Shen. The humanized mouse work uh, was a collaboration since the beginning with Marcus Mantz. We did a lot of experiments together with Tim Willinger here, uh, with some important contribution of Till and Sophia, and the three technicians who helped us to cross those mice and to isolate the human cells for us. Stephanie for the MDS, MDS work, Carolina and Jan for the tumor model, and finally, Regeneron Pharmaceutical 
who generated the knock in alleles uh, in the beginning of this project. So thank you for your attention, and I will take any questions. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Um, skewing them, skewing them, we haven't tried yet. Uh, M1 markers, um, I don't think we looked at, uh, in the tumors. We did several M2 markers. Um, I don't think we did an M1 marker. Jan, where is it? Jan Martinek did, the, did, did those thinnings. Uh, that's something we are doing now. Uh, isolate the, um, the different subsets of monocytes that we can find in the tumor. Characterize their transcriptome actually to get a broader picture than just one marker that, uh, that we saw. Yeah. What is the consistent across whatever tumor graph? Uh, yeah, we only did one tumor cell line uh, with it, so in that model, yes. Uh, now what we are doing is we are going step by step. Use fetal liver cells with tumors from patients, and then bone marrow plus tumor from the same patient. And um, we already see some differences with different donors, which is not really surprising because the tumors are probably different. Uh, but mostly we see the same uh, support for tumor growth. Uh, we haven't done yet the, the M2 characterization in, in those models. So I had a couple of questions. On, on the first part, yeah. at physiologic concentrations of CAS base 9, are any of the molecules in the CS from pathway natural, natural targets, natural substrates? Um, so we did Western blot on CGAS, didn't see any difference. We did work on button sting, and there it's a little bit difficult to interpret because we think that there is constitutive activation of sting in caspase knockouts, uh, and this constitutive activation results in degradation, so it's difficult to compare the levels. We didn't find any cleavage product that could indicate uh, uh, constitutive cleavage, so we, we don't know yet. We don't know yet what the substrate is. And then uh, a couple, two questions on the Mm -hmm. mice, right? So the, the first is, have you tried to do a BL, take a BLT mouse on that background? Yes. So the BLT protocol consists, it can be done with any uh, recipient mouse, but it consists of transplanting, in addition to the bone marrow sample, to the CD34, a small piece of fetal thymus in which T cells can, human T cells can develop and be educated. So what we found there is that, uh, Essentially, we get the advantages of both, uh, so we get much more T cells uh, in well in both. So we did you know, a comparison of NSG versus Mr. G. Uh, the BLT protocol is really good to support T cell development. What we found, and I know what your experience is, that after 12 or 14 weeks uh, in NSG, we get 80% T cells. So it's an incubator for human T cell. In Mr. G, we get 70% T cells. So the, the piece of timer that, that we put in there is still stronger than all the myeloid cytokines. We don't really get a very balanced uh, immune system when we add uh, the piece of thymus. And we did immunization of a Mr. G with just the CD34 or the BLT protocol, and it was quite disappointing. There was not really any improvement of uh, the adaptive response antibody production with the BLT protocol. And then the second question, the last question had to do with uh, the model for myelodysplastic. So one of the concerns is that you've already knocked in genes that are producing cytokines that may well be promoting cell growth. And so have you looked at, do these produce just physiologic levels of the cytokines or are they Yes, so actually that's something I forgot to mention. The interest of knocking in the gene from ATG to stop is that we maintain 
uh, the regulatory sequencing, including promoter UTRs uh, from the mouse, the endogenous ones, and we get a uh, physiological expression of the cytokines. So yes, we provide those cytokines, but it's not as if we were overexpressing or injecting a cytokine that would be supraphysiological. So that's, um, uh, in theory, that should be physiological uh, of the cytokines, at least physiological mouse levels of the cytokines. We know that TPO, for example, uh, there is a tenfold difference between human and mouse uh, in steady state in the blood. Uh, and what we find with a humanized one is something intermediate, so it's probably a non-transcriptional effect. Uh, we did not uh, really characterize that. We would need to isolate them and do MLR experiments. So presumably they would be, well, yeah, they could be more human restricted. I, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I don't really want to do those experiments on this model. Wait until we can do the experiment on the, the same mouse, which has human HLA knocked in. And we have those mice uh, ready to start working with now. At least with HLA2. So, what we did is a Listeria infection, and we measured CD8 T cell activation based on degranulation and production of interferon gamma. Uh, and we did side-by-side -side NSG versus Mr. G. There was essentially no response in NSG and some response in uh, Mr. G. So some, response, some responses can be functional, but I, I think T cell responses are still highly defective in those, all those humanized mice. Here we did not try to improve uh, adaptive responses. We could have an, an indirect effect. Better innate response could result in uh, better adaptive. We did not really see except in the Listeria experiment that I just described, we didn't really, uh, didn't really see any strong improvement of the adaptive response. So when we immunize with CFA-KLH, for example, which is a really strong uh, stimulus, it's not much better than in an NSG mouse. Yeah, um, no, we haven't done it in this model, but people have done it in other models. Um, so one of the questions is, of course, if it's restricted against mouse or human or a combination of both. So I think there are some data in the literature where people did some spectrotyping of the, of the TCR, and they say that there is some diversity, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I said, we did not do much on the T cell part. Uh, we are working now on knocking in a number of genes that could improve with the goal of improving actually thymic lymphopoiesis, and then we can do all those experiments. We, we didn't really have any reason to spend a lot of effort on T cells when our goal was to improve innate immunity, but clearly those are important questions. One of the questions that we frequently get the mouse is much smaller and is much less T lymphocytes than a human, so just because of the number, would you have the same, the same diversity of the, the repertoire? Can you screen the entire repertoire with a mouse that has much less cells? So that's, yeah, that's an, an important question that we can address with a T cell improved model soon, hopefully. So there are many viruses that express BCL2 um, analogs uh, to prevent cell death. There are many viruses that encode caspase inhibitors, uh, again, to prevent cell death. Uh, 